Well, good morning, everybody. Um, it is a good morning. It is a good morning. Um, we are keeping our fingers crossed that our guest will be with us. Otherwise, you just get to watch my back up here. So it's like like in a fun house, right? You get to see both sides at the same time. So hopefully there's, there's nothing embarrassing back there. Um, so our guest this morning um, is hopefully uh, Nicholas Shatle. Um, he is a foreign exchange student from Palestine studying in Fort Dodge this year. Um, and uh, he, as part of his exchange program, one of the things that he is um, asked to do is to share about his home uh, with folks here. And uh, so uh, we heard about Nicholas through the um, Presbyterian newsletter. He says five minutes. Okay. All right. So we heard about Nicholas from the Presbyterian newsletter. Um, and so connected with the church in Fort John. And um, so uh, connected through the, the church in Fort Dodge with Nicholas. Um, uh, Nicholas lives in, uh, when he doesn't live in Fort Dodge, he lives in Beit Jala, uh, which is a city in Palestine uh, just uh, northwest. Okay, so, so that's north, right? Um, so if, if we are in Beit Jala, the airport is Bethlehem. And about Urbandale is Jerusalem. Um, I may have those I may have those distances wrong. So I, one of those is closer than the other, but um, there's my mental map of Palestine in my head. Um, so uh, sort of situated uh, in between um, Bethlehem and Jerusalem, but at an angle. Um, and so everything, uh, something to know about Israel and Palestine, of course, is that everything is very close together, right? Um, which is, I mean, which is common of, of really cities anywhere east of the Atlantic, right? That things are much more compact than they tend to be here in the United States. Um, uh, Beit Jala is uh, in the West Bank. Uh, so that's that's the, the area that is controlled by Israel, um, but uh, was not part of the sort of the original uh, 1948 uh, demarcation. I believe uh, the West Bank came under Israeli control after 67. Is that right? Um, so um, so uh, Nicholas lives in the West Bank under Israeli control. Um, and I actually don't know a lot more about um, sort of Nicholas's uh, particular status under Israeli law. So I'm sure he will have some things to tell us about that. Um, and so we've invited him to tell us, you know, what's home like, uh, but also to um, recognizing that uh, we have our own uh, sort of, we have our own historical understandings of what's going on um, between Israel and Palestine and the surrounding countries. And there are people who lived in Palestine before Israel came into existence as a territorial entity in 1948. Um, Nicholas, being a high schooler right now, did not live in Palestine at that time, right? Um, presumably his family did. Um, so his grandparents would have been around uh, during that time. Um, and um, I'm just taking a wild guess here, but Nicholas is almost always a Christian name. Um, so another piece to uh, to just remember in the in the context of of Israel, Palestine, the the Arab world around them. Um, 
that we're not just talking about Jews and Muslims. We're talking about Jews and Muslims and Christians and uh, adherents of other smaller uh, religious groups. Um, and so religion and ethnicity are not the same thing. Um, religion, ethnicity, and nationality are three distinct things. Uh, so just another piece there. Oh, oh, he's entered the waiting room. Here he comes. Out of Mary's way. Good morning. Oh, good morning. <clears throat> um, I'm very honored to be with you today at the um, at your church. I apologize for being ten minutes late. <laughs> I had to do something. That's new. Uh, Nicholas, I'm Nathan Williams. Uh, we've been corresponding. Um, and this is our contemporary issues class. We have everybody wave just like we're at Kinect Stadium. There we go. <laughs> uh, so I was uh, just briefly introducing um, uh, the, the exchange program uh, that you're on uh, in Fort Dodge and that. Um, uh, part of what you're doing is uh, sharing with folks here about um, about life at home for you um, and trying to give a little bit of the geography of where Beit Java is. But um, I have told them everything I know, so uh, I will hand it over to you. Uh huh. Sounds great. <laughs> Thank you for introducing me. Um, let me. Just a second, I need to share my screen. One second. Here we go. Can you see my screen now? Great. So, uh, good morning, everybody. Today, I'm going to talk about my country, Palestine. As you can see, I'm going in in, today. I'm going to mention a couple of stuff. I'm going to talk about general information about my country. I'm going to mention or like talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, some Palestinian traditions and famous and holy places in Palestine, since I'm going to be presenting to you guys. <clears throat> so where's Palestine? Palestine is located in Southwest Asia. It's in the heart of the Middle East and it's a great strategic location because it's linking the three continents, all Asia, Europe, and Africa. Here's Palestine right here. And it's linking all major continents in the East, as you can see. <clears throat> There's four countries around Palestine. Palestine is surrounded by Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria, as you can see, from all different sites. The total area of Palestine is around 2,000, uh, 27,000 square kilometers. It's a little bit smaller than the state of Massachusetts. Uh, the population right now in Palestine, the people that are living in the West Bank and Gaza, which I'll mention later on in the presentation, is about 3.8 million. The vast majority of uh, the population there are Muslims, so we are kind of a Muslim country, but we, we do have around 3% Christian population. And um, I happen to be part of this 3%. 3%. <laughs> so how's the weather there? 
<clears throat> we actually have the exact same weather as California. So it's, um, we have a Mediterranean weather. It's never too hot, never too cold. We barely get snow. I don't know how I'm gonna deal with the snow here in Iowa, but I'll figure that out later. <laughs> it's uh, cold, rainy in winter, and hot, dry in summer. Uh, about agriculture, we actually, since we have the exact same weather as in California, I'm weather, we are able to grow a lot of stuff. And actually, one of the most famous things for Palestinians to grow, and it's actually one of the Palestinian symbols, is the olive tree. So you'll find every family, every farmer, no matter what he farms, he'll always have a couple of olive trees. You'll see them in the streets, you'll see them in someone's backyard, you'll always see olive trees everywhere. <laughs> one more thing is grapevines. We are famous for grapevines, figs, and citrus. We have, especially in the city of Jericho, we grow a lot of citrus. I'm sure you've heard of Jericho before since it's mentioned in the Bible a couple of times. It's, yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to start talking about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, a lot of people might think it's complicated, but it's actually not that complicated. I'm just I did a quick summary here, so I'm going to talk about it. So, who, who's uh, Theodor Herzl? He is the Zion, he's, he's a Zionist leader. He was born in uh, Hungary. Many, Jew, many Jews spread it in different countries, and his idea was to make alternative... Uh, he, his, his idea was to make a country to gather them all in it. He made a conference in 1897, to obtain support for his idea. After they decided to build their country, after, after that conference, they decided to, to build their country in the land of Palestine. As if there was no people there, but sadly there was. So in 1918, Jewish immigration started and Palestinians always welcome Jewish people in there. So them immigrating was not a problem. Muslims, Christians, and Jews lived in peace there for many years. Which is, which you guys, which some of you guys might be surprised, uh, surprised of. Palestinians don't have any, Muslims or Christians don't have any problems with Jews. It's the whole Israeli-Palestinian conflict is not based on religion, which a lot of people think is, but it's not. <laughs> So after the proclaim, proclaim of the State of Israel in 1948, the first Arab-Jewish war happened. And the result of that Arab-Jewish war, which happened after the proclaim of the State of Israel, um, a lot of... Uh, more than 700,000 Palestinian refugees resulted in that war because Arabs lost to Israel because it was funded by many uh, veto countries, such as the US, the United Kingdom, um, and Fr France, I think. Yeah, there's a, it was funded by a lot of countries. And Arab countries that were not in the best political or financial place because they were all under, they all had just gotten their independence. They were all under occupation from not a kingdom. So they weren't at their best time to be able to fight wars, even though there were multiple countries against a country that has just, that has just formed. So what happened after the war? More than 700,000 refugees Resulted. The United Nations Relief and Works Agency, the UNRWA, I'm sure you've heard of it, defines a Palestinian refugee as a person whose normal place of residence was Palestine between uh, June 1946 and May 1948, which is where the war happened, which is when the war happened and when all that tension happened. Full of both, and uh, it's also the 
they define him as a person who lost both their homes and means of level of uh, level as a result of the 1948 Arab Israeli conflict. And today, sadly, there's more than five million ref Palestinian refugees around the world, which were all which were all either Palestinians who were kicked out of their homes or Palestinians born outside of their land and cannot return to their homeland, even though their house, some of their houses are still there. <laughs> so, how Palestine becomes through the years? What, what's happening? At 1946, but when, when I told you the Jewish, Jewish, the Jewish immigration to the land of Palestine has started. A lot of Jew, uh, Jewish people were buying land. So as you can see in the map here, it's all map that Jewish people have bought because they were funded and a lot of other stuff. In 1947, which is, where, uh, which is when the state of Israel was declared, as you can see here, they owned most of this land and the result of uh, they owned the vast majority of Palestine which of course Palestinians were not happy with because they owned this land for hundreds of years they've been living there for a lot of time so if someone kicks them out of their house and and actually do massacres on them which I won't be mentioning a lot in the presentation but there's a lot of Palestinian massacres that happened too, which Palestinians always mention and will never forget. They took this land, then in 40, 1949, after the Seven Day War, they. Oh, sorry. As you can see, they continued to take more and more land through the years. And right now, they're continuing to take land in the in the West Bank, which is where I live, illegally under international law. They're building settlements, illegal settlements, and putting them in strategic places. I'll mention that in the presentation later. So, what remains from Palestine right now? As as I told you before, Palestine, the rest, the only parts of Palestine left are the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, which you can see in the book, oh. which, you, which you can see here. This is the West Bank, supposedly, and this is the Gaza Strip. West Bank, Gaza Strip, and East part of Jerusalem is supposed to be under the, under the ruling of the Palestinian authorities, but sadly it's not people living there have uh, our their houses some of their houses are being destroyed i don't know if you've heard about this but there's a neighborhood called sheikh jarrah and it's actually been ethnically less no more than two months ago the the israeli government claims that their houses belong to israel and that they that even though they were living there for more than 70 years they do not own their houses and the only way for them to start to stay there is to pay rent for their own house which they've been living in for more than 70 years which is crazy so palestinians now only own 22 percent from their land some actions that israel committed against palestinians Checkpoints. Uh, actually, in the West Bank, in the West Bank, even though it's supposed to be under the occupation uh, under the Palestinian authorities, we cannot move from one city to another without going through a checkpoint. Uh, the checkpoints, as you can see in some of these pictures, restrict. Here we go. I'll have more pictures. Separate each city from the other. They restrict the movement of Palestinian and prevent them from going to jobs, schools, and hospitals. Actually, because of because of checkpoints 
and the wall, which I'll mention in the presentation later. I actually have an uncle that lives in Jerusalem and I live in Bethlehem and I cannot visit him even though technically he lives 10 minutes away. I only see him once or twice a year because of the, these checkpoints. And I'm not allowed to go to Jerusalem without a pass, which they never give Palestinians. It's a person is considered lucky if he gets a Palestinian pass. And it's crazy since he's living in East Jerusalem, which is considered part of Palestine. And I can, cannot even visit him. So I only see my uncle once or twice a year because of that. Also, I mentioned the legal settlements in the West Bank. Israel didn't get enough from taking Palestinian lands and try to control what remains from West Bank and Gaza. They also started building illegal settlements and strategic places and built presidential areas, as you can see in some of these pictures here. This is all Palestinian land. It's either on land that they restricted Palestinians from building on, they take it and they build settlements on it. There, there, right now, there's 205 settlements in the West Bank, including Jerusalem and, uh, and Gaza Strip. So, yeah, as you can see, 205 is not a small number. For It's like 205 small villages in a land that's not too big, even. So, the separation wall. It, uh, it was built in, the, in 2002 in the West Bank to prevent Palestinians to enter, to enter their area, some of their areas. As I told you before, it's, it's actually separating Jerusalem from Palestine, from the rest of Palestine or the West Bank, so I can't even visit my ankle because of this illegal wall, which, didn't, which wasn't even built on the agreed land. So it's not like built around this area, it's actually inside. So it, it took some parts of the West Bank. Illegally, of course. The, the total length of it is 786 kilometers. And until now they've only built around four, 400 kilometers from it. They destroyed many agricultural lands, including olive trees fields and Here's something, Palestinian farmers consider olive trees as their children for some reason. So when an Israeli settler comes and destroys hundreds of olive trees, which most of them their grandfather have planted or something, it's, it's like taking their old child. They also reduce the available water supply. We as Palestinians all, are all required to build wells in our homes because when Israel sends water to Palestine, which is our water, but when Israel sends water to Palestinians, they have to store it because they never know when they'll send more water. And this severely affects how expensive the water is, um, how uh, also farming is severely affected. Palestinians can't farm even though I can't farm very well, can't have really big farming and are limited because of this, because obviously water is needed for farming, but it, we have a li limited amount and it's becoming more and more expensive. Therefore, farming is becoming more and more difficult. So enough about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I'll happily answer questions after I finish the presentation. But now I'm going to talk about some Palestinian traditions. So as you guys, you guys probably know this one, traditional food in desert. Actually, we have uh, one of the most traditional things. I feel like it's very well known here in Iowa. It's hummus and falafel. Maybe you don't know what falafel is, but hummus is well known. It's actually a traditional Palestinian dish. And we also have the makubi, which actually means uh, upside down. It's, it's the direct translation for upside down. It's called that because you cook it with meat in the bottom of the pot, wires in front of it, and then you actually flip it on a uh, flip, flip the pot on a plate, and this is how, we, how it turns out. 
And this is why we call it maklube, which in Arabic means upside down. It's actually really delicious. I wish I was able to be with you and maybe let you try or something. I will. Uh, about the sweets, we actually have something called knafe. It's a special uh, dough, cheese, and thick syrup of uh, sugar and pistachios. As you can see, it's really delicious. I can. Uh, traditional customs. So women in the old days, not, not nowadays people just wear normal clothing like this or other kinds of clothing, but the traditional clothes that people wear in festivals or special occasions, for women it's called the thobe, and each city actually has a different kind of thobe. So as you can see, they always wear this thing with, um, what's the word? Wait, let me check. Embroidery. They each each city has a different tobe with different embroidery. So it Palestinian used to know where the person is, I would like from what city or village, by the embroidery on their tobes. The tobe is the thing that women wear, as you can see here. So yeah, it's a really it's really it, it's really important in Palestinian culture. Actually, my grandmother used to be an embroiderer and she always used to wear one of these. <laughs> As you can see here too, this thing here is called El Kufiye. I actually have it with me right here. Okay, I couldn't find it, but <laughs> this is called uh, <coughs> El Kofiya. It's actually something Palestinian, all, uh, Palestinian, some Palestinians always wear it. It's related to the Palestinian culture and it's really important in culture. It's something farmers used to wear when they're farming or the president was, would wear and while giving speeches something. So yeah, it is really important in Palestinian culture. Also, as you can see here, some of the um, <clears throat> important people or like old people, usually the eldest, would always wear this thing with the kufiya over their heads. As, uh, as you can see here, just like this picture. They would wear it. I wish I had another picture, but you can see it here. Traditional dance. Uh, the traditional dance in Palestine is called Dabke, and it's actually a really beautiful kind of dance. Wait, yeah, you can see in this picture, women and men dance together, and it's a really beautiful. I also have a video of it here. <laughs> in the video actually it's really important every school even has a dabka team we have 
the Dubka team in my in my school is actually rated the first Dubka team in all Palestine. So we do have a really good dance team in my school. <clears throat> Here we go. Holy and famous places in Palestine. In Palestine, we have a lot of famous places for Muslims, such as Al-Aqsa Al Mosque, which is one of the holiest places for Muslims. It's located in the old city of Jerusalem. Mus Muslims consider it as a holy place because they believe that Prophet Muhammad prayed on it with all prophets. <clears throat> we also have the Dome of the Rock, which is built besides Al-Aqsa Mosque by this guy, Abd al Malik bin Marwan, in 19 and at 69 CE after Christmas. There's 15 stages that leads to Al Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock because they're located in the center of Jerusalem. So, technically, these doors are also doors for the city of Jerusalem. So the city of Jerusalem has a wall around it, a, a very old one, and there's 15 doors. I believe seven are open right now. Church of the Holy Spirit. It's where, where it's believed that Jesus uh, is crucified. He lies in the northern quarter of the old city of Jerusalem. It was, the, it was located in... Uh, in the year 336, it was actually burned and destroyed many, many different times, but it's always, it has always been there. So it was rebuilt multiple times. Yeah, as you can see in the picture, there's different things in the um, One of the most important cities is also Jericho, for sure. You guys for sure know about this. It was mentioned multiple times in the Bible. It's we call it the city of palm trees, and it's actually one of the oldest city cities in the whole world. It's also not only it's the oldest city; it's actually the lowest point on Earth, with four hundred seventeen um, meters below sea level. <laughs> it overlooks on the Dead Sea, which is a tourist and reminder area that cures some skin diseases. So a lot of people go to the to the Dead Sea to put Dead Sea mud on their faces, which I'm sure you know there's always some you because you must have owned a mask or something that had Dead Sea mud in it. It's really it has a lot of good things for your skin. <clears throat> And we also have Tel Aviv there. It's, I don't know why you call this in English, but it's this thing right here. <laughs> so that was the presentation. I would love to also talk about Bethlehem, but I was sadly, but I was not able to add a slot for it for some reason. I'll talk about it just a little here. So also, Bethlehem actually has, here you go, as you see, this is my city, this is where I was born, and where Jesus Christ was also born. Uh, we have the Church of the Nativity, which is the church for Jesus' birth, as you can see in this picture here. It's, uh, this is the door for it, <clears throat> and it's really beautiful on the inside. As you can see here, this is where Jesus Christ was born. There's many pictures. Many tourists always come to visit this place. It's, it's really beautiful. There. It's just amazing. This here are some cities of the city of Bethlehem. This is in some of the alleys that leads to the church. Some other pictures of Bethlehem. It's a really beautiful city. And actually, Beit Jala, which is where, where Beit Jala, Bethlehem is separated in three different towns. So it's they're all considered Bethlehem, but there's three major towns. There's Beth, Beth, Bethlehem, which is the main one, Beit Sahur, 
and Beit Jala, and they're all actually considered, even though, it, as I mentioned before, Palestine is a Muslim majority country, in Beit Lahem, the majority of the populations are Christians. So most Christians either live in Beit Lahem or the city of Ramallah. Other cities are mainly dominated by Muslim people. And actually, Palestine, Palestinians, either Muslims, Jews, or or Christians all live in peace until now. You might be surprised, but we still have Palestinian Jews in Palestine who refuse to take the Israeli passport because they believe that what Israel is doing is immoral and other stuff. And that. So yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. How safe is Bethlehem and Beit? Sorry, I can't. I can't hear you. I don't know. Um, how how safe is it? In Bethlehem. <clears throat> Here it is. For tourists, it's actually really safe. You guys, as I mentioned before, Palestine is... Wait, let me open that up. One second, I need to try a picture so I can explain more. Palestine. As I'm... One person of her one. Can you see my screen now? <clears throat> yeah. As you can see in this picture, Palestine is separated in many different places, Israeli settlements, West Bank, Gaza, all that. For tourists, it's actually really safe. You guys can go through all, you can go to anywhere with no problems. The checkpoints are nothing for you. You, 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 you don't even have to go through it. But for Palestinians, it's a different story because we're a threat to Israel's safety, which is obviously not true. They only use that to cover for the international media. But safe-wise, I believe it's... Here's the thing. Everything that you see in the media actually happens. Palestinians die until today. Actually, a couple of days ago... I'm sorry. <clears throat> uh, 14 year old was shot and killed by the Israeli forces and they still have his body until now. His parents cannot grieve, they cannot do what parents would do if their 14 year old son who died would do. They, they still don't have his body, even though they killed a 14 year old. But all these stories that you hear about happens, but I've lived there most of my life, and I believe it's safe. I don't know how to answer the question, depending on what you mean, what, what your definition is by safe, honestly. like It is safe for me compared to other places in Palestine, such as Gaza, which is way more dangerous because Israel keeps bombing it. So I believe the West Bank is way more safe than the Gaza Strip. But... I'm not sure if it's considered safe in your terms. And I hear you saying it's safer for us than it is for you. Sorry, what? Um, I, I hear you saying it's it's safer for Americans than it is for Palestinians. If I'm hearing you right. Oh, it's actually... No, what I said is that Americans or people with other people with all like non-Palestinians are able to travel between all Palestine, all the Lord of Palestine with no problems. All these checkpoints and the wall and all these stuff are only for Palestinians because again, they're a threat to the Israeli security, which is obviously not true. 
they only say that to make Palestinians either go out of their land to, which is true actually, a lot of Palestinians are immigrants now. Most of my family are immigrants. I have family in many different Arab countries. I have family in the US. I have family in Australia, Canada. So as you can see, Palestinians are everywhere because of that. Other questions? Go ahead. Okay. So, and uh, noticing, as you said, they they lived. Um, everyone lived in peace before 1948, uh, when the state of Israel was created. And, and that seems to be the, the, the reason that there, that there is not peace anymore. Sorry, I'm not sure I get the question. What's the question exactly? Um, so uh, we were hearing that um, the, the, the groups um, lived in peace until 1948. And then it was with the creation of the state of Israel that, um, that then the groups no longer were able to live in, in peace with each other. Are we hearing that right? Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and again, that has nothing to do with religion. Jews are, are have always lived there in peace. Actually, before 1948, Jewish people who lived in Palestine were considered refugees because, as I told you, Jewish immigration <clears throat> started in as early as 1419 and people had no problem with it. But when these, when the refugees, <clears throat> you welcome to your country, take more than half your country's land. I don't know if that's even human. Like imagine welcoming a refugee to your country and one day he wants to rule your country. Not rule it in, in a way. He, he, they kicked people out of their homes. They did massacres. Millions of Palestinians died. Not Maybe not millions, but hundreds of thousands of Palestinians have died because of that. And you'll actually find Palestinians who still know where their houses are, or maybe their house is still there, but they can't go there because some Israeli lives in it now. Nicholas, what are your future plans? Oh, Actually, I, I, here we go. I study in a German school in Palestine. <clears throat> it's at a national German school, a Lutheran one to be exact. And so me graduating from my high school back home would, would be seen as graduating from German high school. Therefore, I'm going to study high school in Germany. And that's mainly because of that, that's the thing. Most, as as always, most parents want their best for their children, which is why my parents really encouraged me to go and study abroad and hopefully live abroad because they didn't want me to live with all this political tension, with all these problems. Even though it's hard for them to, to be happy for their children to live on the other side of the world, for example, they still want the best for me. And many Palestinian families believe that. So, so I'll, you'll find a lot of Palestinian families that encourage their children to study abroad. But my future plans are to study psychology in Germany. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, was, I'd be curious, what government entity issued you your passport? Is oh. the Israeli government issued this? Or? Here's the thing. Palestinian this is, agency. 
No, here, as you can see here, I have a Palestinian passport. So uh, because that, that's because I live in the West Bank. Palestinians who live in Gaza Strip have a different passport, a different Palestinian passport. And Palestinians who live inside of Israel, which I, I'm, I'm surprised I didn't mention, there's actually 20% of Israelis, like 20% of the Israel population, aren't identify themselves as Palestinians, but they were forced to hold an Israeli passport. So I actually have friends who, uh, my uncle who lives in Jerusalem actually holds uh, an Israeli passport. It's the people, Palestinians who have Israel, Israel passports are the ones who have either not been killed or kicked out of their homes and still live in the, what's called the land of Israel now. So you'll find Palestinians with three different passports. The Gaza Strip one, the West Bank one, which is the one I have right now, and the Israeli one. And they're actually treated as second class citizens so they're not, not able to do a lot of stuff. And there's many rules that discriminate against them. And actually in the Israeli parliament, uh, a couple, that happened like a couple of days ago, that, which indicates the discrimination that happens for Palestinians right now. One of the Israeli parliament people called out a Palestinian in there and told them that he's there only because they didn't, that only because Herzl didn't do his job correctly. They didn't kill all Palestinians. And that actually happened in a parliament. So it's kind of close to a white American calling... Um, and it's kind of close to a white, white American calling a, an, a Native American in the parliament telling him that he's only here because they didn't kill all those people. It's crazy. And that actually happened like, what, two days ago? So yeah, there's a lot of discrimination happening there. A follow-up question to that. Are there some nations that will not recognize your Palestinian passport that you're not able to travel in those countries? Here's the thing, that has been, actually this passport, the Palestinian authorities are actually considered a country uh, so it is recognized by the United Nations, therefore I can use it to travel to any country in the world. But most countries do not grant visa, uh, uh, do not, like, you need, I, with this passport, passport, I need visas to travel to most countries. By most, I mean all countries in the world except a few. Even Arab ones, surprisingly. So a lot of people, that's something, I, I, it just came to my mind. A lot of people think that Palestinians can go to any Arab country since they think it's like just like the US or something. It's not. Lebanon, Egypt, and the countries I mentioned are uh, right around Palestine are completely different countries. Even though they speak the same language and kind of have the same culture, Palestinians can go there. And if they do, they're considered refugees there. Go ahead. Any other questions? Yeah. I'm going to move up here so I hope you can understand me a little better. Can see me yeah. a little better. I think of Palestine and what has happened, happened in this country if Russia or China or Brazil suddenly moved in and took over uh, New York, Philadelphia, and most of the country in between. They said we could have Delaware, but we had to be careful of what we were. And I don't know how well you know the geography, but I'm I think sorry. you can work. I'm sorry, can you, can you please repeat the question? The internet caught, I, I couldn't hear your full conversation. Okay, I think of what happened in Palestine in terms of what would have happened if a large, strong country like Brazil or China or Russia had come in and taken over the, all of the territory from New York to Philadelphia. And that's a large area with its own culture. And this new country 
have moved in and said, we're on your side, we're not enemies, but you're gonna to have to do things our way. Now, with that in mind, I think that's how Palestinians think of the Israeli occupation. What would fix any of this? Well, how can we get out of the current cycle of distrust and maybe hatred? That's a good question. I'm really happy you asked this question. Um, I'm happy you had thoughts about what, what Palestinians think, but I'm, I, I don't think this is what happened. Uh, the people who came from different places in the world were all citizens of different countries. They didn't come from one country. Wait. What? What's the question? I'm, I'm so sorry. I know you said it twice, but I don't really... Oh, what, what do you think? You're asking me for a solution for all this. I'm not sure I have a solution. Like, so. Partly, I don't think a solution is going to come overnight. But yeah. work and what would particularly make most Palestinians happy? Oh, for Palestinian, uh, actually for most Palestinians that were kicked out of their homes to be able to come back to their homes and live in the state of Palestine, for it to be under the Palestinian authority since they actually own the land. I believe that would make most Palestinians happy. They, Palestinians, are just people who were who are just people who have been through a lot. People just want peace. A lot of people think that they just want to. I don't know why, but in the Western media, Palestinians are shown as some kind of barbaric people who just want destruction. But that's not the way. Palestinians are normal human beings who just want to live in peace with the right of movement, right of stuff. So maybe giving Palestinians more rights, giving the Palestinian refugees the right to come back to their homes. It's complicated, but I believe this part- I get the feeling point. that the only thing that would really fix this, I, will, I think that the only thing that would fix this for Palestinians would be if the Israelis, and I'm not saying the Jews, the Israelis simply moved out and found another homeland. Maybe the Israelis could still have visiting rights on the Temple Mount. But other than that, I think you just, I think, I think that from 1918 on, the British and eventually the Americans became the invaders. Now, is there anything short of getting the invaders to go away would, that would fix things? In a way, yes. Well, I don't believe that's a possible solution because even though I'd love to say that they can, but many can't. Many only have an Israeli citizenship now. So it's uh, that, which is what makes it more complicated. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I have an answer to be honest. Like, as I said, we are just people who want to live in peace. And me as a Palestinian teenager, I doubt I'll have a solution for this issue that has been there for more than 70 years. Or no, more than 80 years now. It's, it's complicated, but I believe Palestinians should not be treated like this. I believe Israeli settlements and those banks shouldn't be there. I believe that... 700,000 people shouldn't have to go through all that. That That is what I believe. And for a current solution right now, I have no idea. It's for world leaders to figure this out, but sadly, not a lot of people talk about this. The whole occupation thing is going on. And also, you said, you said that as if the... Yeah, and I see where you're coming from, but... That only applies if this happened 70 years ago and now nothing is happening. 
the occup occupation stuff are still happening. The wall is still being bent, built on site Palestinian land, just taking Palestinian lands. Israeli settlements are actually bent on Palestinian lands. So everything right now, the can, let me search that word. I need to know what it is. All the oppression that's that happened 70 years ago is still happening today. So in order to actually look for a solution, we should maybe stop that oppression first and then start looking for a solution because you can't expect people who have been massacred, kicked out of their homes, their land has been and still is being stolen, their children are being killed, as I mentioned, a 14-year-old actually pet passed away due to an Israeli soldier a couple of days ago. And guess what happened to the soldier that kicked him? Nothing. He's probably watching a movie with his family now. Like nothing happens to them. Even though the Israeli, Israel tries to show itself as a peaceful and modern country in the Middle East, as maybe a democracy in the Middle East, it's just all a cover for all the oppression that happens to Palestine, Palestinians. I, I can go on in multiple stories, but what I'm trying to say here is, in order to actually look for a solution, Israel should be, uh, Israel should be, should stop this oppression, which I don't think it will unless the world actually starts to recognize what's happening to Palestinians. Because the world media never talks about it at all. Which is why I find it so important for me to spread the message and talk about my country. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry to turn it off. Is it correct or is it true that the violent city of Jerusalem in general seemed to be able to cooperate and get along? Is that a kind of unique situation in Jerusalem that not in the rest of the country. Sorry, what? Can you maybe? So, um, yeah. Uh, so, Warren has the sense that uh, the divided city of Jerusalem um, is able to coexist uh, fairly peacefully. Um, is is there something specific about Jerusalem uh, that? makes things work there that does not work uh, in the rest of the country. Hey, well, you might think it's peaceful there, but it's not. Palestinians there are under, uh, are under oppression on their daily life. Palestinians, um, as I said, there some Palestinians there are being ethnically cleansed from their homes, which they still live in right now. They're asked to pay rent for their own homes. Um, some of them are not a, are not able. They can't even give. They can't. If let's say if um, I'm a Palestinian with an Israeli citizenship from Jerusalem marries someone from the West Bank, they can't even give their wife the citizenship. Therefore, they can't live with them unless they move to the West Bank. And if they do that, their Israeli Israeli citizenship would be taken from them. And they'd be giving a Palestinian one, which would take their right to go and all other different places in Palestine. So um, the thing is, the situation in Jerusalem is really complicated since all major stuff are happening there. It's considered the capital of both countries. The tension there is enormous. So I don't believe what's happening there would work in different cities. No. I don't know what's making it work there, but it's a lot it's it's a lot there. A lot happens there. It's not peace, exactly peaceful there. And I would love to show you some stuff. I, there's um a Palestinian guy that actually shows what's happening in Jerusalem daily. And there's also multiple channels and multiple stuff that shows what, what happens every day there. I think his name is Ben. 
I don't know if I'll be able to find them right now, but uh, I'm sorry, I, I I forgot his account name, but oppression happens to Palestinians there daily, so yeah. Uh, sharing she visited Israel in 1995 you said uh, 1995 and felt that tension um, and thought that the tension was just religious tension but she she is able to see the political dimension of that now as you describe it for us um, oh. and so she just wants to say thank you for that all right you're welcome here's the thing a lot of people think the Israel is being attacked by Palestinian terrorists. This is how the media always shows it. And uh, it's all about religion. The Palestinians hate Jewish people, which is not true. We do have Palestinians. We do have, we do have pa Palestinian Jews, as I mentioned in the presentation. Also, there is, uh, you, you, if you're interested or you want to search into that more, there's a company, uh, not, not a company, there's an orga organization called Jewish Forest for Peace, and it's mainly, and it's actually a really big, uh, really big organization that shows what happens in, in Palestine daily. From a, from a Jewish point of view, it's Jews who are against what, or against the unhumane thing that Israel does every day. They actually show what, what happens every day. Here's the video of the congressman who's telling as you can see this this is how that happened two days ago the video of the congressman who attacked a palestinian in congress they, they show what happens in palestine daily so everything that happens there they always show it if you maybe want to search that out they're called jewish voice for peace and yeah it's the whole situation is not based on religion which a lot of people think it is they think that Palestinians hate Jewish people is not true. It's all political. It's all, everybody wants to live in peace. It's not about religion now. Now go ahead. Is that, uh, that organization, is that Jewish voice for peace? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, Nicholas, I just want to say thank you uh, for sharing with us this morning and giving us this perspective. Thank you, well, thank you. Thank you all for listening. <laughs> I really appreciate thank you so this much. If, yes. If you want to share any uh, extra resources with us, uh, you can send those to me and I can uh, share those with our group. Um, oh, but we are so grateful for this insight. Wait, I'm, I'm so grateful to be able to talk to you guys today. I love how interested you guys were. And I love that now you can actually see it from a different point of view. I, that lady over there, thank you for saying this definitely now. <laughs> Again, it's not about religion. It's all about stuff that has nothing to do with religion. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. <laughs>